You've been told many times that sodium gives up its electron to chlorine, and together they can bond ionically to make salt. But you've never really been explained the reason why. How come sodium is the one giving up the electron and not the other way around? How come chlorine doesn't give up the electron? So today we're going to study something called periodic trends, and this will help you understand why certain elements on the periodic table tend to give up electron or tend to lose electrons. These are just patterns that we tend to see on the periodic table. The first periodic trend that we want to discuss is something called atomic radius. Atomic radius is basically the size of the atom. So if you take a quick glance at the periodic table, you see a trend or a pattern. If you notice, within any row, pick any row, it starts to decrease left to right. Okay, So that means the biggest atom is found farthest to the left, and as you go within the same row, once you reach the end of the row, that's the smallest element. So for example, pick lithium, okay, atomic number three. Lithium is the biggest in his row, and then neon, which is farthest to the right on the periodic table, is actually the smallest. Okay, but I don't want you to memorize it, I want you to understand the reason why. So the reason why atoms tend to shrink or decrease as you go from left to right is because not only are you adding more electrons to the atom, okay, so then you would think, wait, if I add more electrons, don't they get bigger? In some ways, yes, that's true, but you're only adding electrons to the same energy level, okay? What you have to think about is there's also a nucleus that's here, and every time you move to the right, you're adding more and more protons in the nucleus. So we have, so you have more protons, there's an increased nuclear charge, so the pull from the nucleus is actually stronger. It's actually pulling in the electron cloud, okay? So for example, again, lithium is the biggest in his row, and then as you go from left to right, they start to shrink because there's also more and more protons, and then by the time you get to neon, it's really small. But look at what happens when you change or you move to a different row. So as soon as you get to neon, he's the smallest, number 10. Then you have atomic number 11, which is sodium, and sodium is now massive, okay? And the reason why that happens is because now you're moving to a higher energy level. So there is an S1 electron that's like way out here. So that's why that electron cloud is so huge because that electron is way out here in the third energy level but then notice how the trend resets or restarts again. Okay, so now it starts to shrink as you move left to right, and now argon is the smallest within that row, number 18, atomic number 18. But then look at what happens at number 19, potassium. Okay, so potassium now gets massive again, but then as you go left to right, they shrink. And then once you get to rubidium, number 37, then it expands again, okay? So there's a trend or a pattern and that is left to right, they start to shrink, then you go to a different energy level, it gets bigger, and then it starts to shrink again. So you just have to understand why this happens. So we know that going left to right, it shrinks, and then top to bottom within the same column, they expand or get bigger, because now you're adding electrons to a higher energy level. Before I get into discussing the next three trends, you just have to know a little bit of vocabulary, and that is, what is the difference between cation and anion? A cation loses electrons, and then it becomes positively charged. And it's kind of weird to think about, but when you lose something, you become positive? Why is that? Well, electrons, remember, are negatively charged particles. So if you lose electrons, you're going to become positive overall. On the other hand, an anion gains electrons. So if you gain electrons, you become negatively charged. And a simple way to remember this is for cations, cats land on their paws, as in positive. Okay, so cations are positive. Cats land on their paws. Anions, a negative ion. It starts with the letter A, so an anion is a negative ion. That's how I remember that. Now it's really important to understand this concept before I start discussing ionic radius and that is cations shrink and anions expand and you have to understand why. So cations actually get smaller because again because you're losing electrons if you lose electrons that nuclear charge now becomes that much stronger so now it's pulling in the electron cloud. Okay, It's like a tug of war. It's a tug of war between the protons in the nucleus and the electrons out here. 
well now you have more protons in the center so now it has an easier time pulling the the electron cloud closer to the nucleus so that's why cations shrink now anions get bigger because now you have electrons you have an extra electron or maybe two extra electrons or three and now they outnumber the number of protons here in the center of the nucleus right so the protons pretend they're playing tug of war the protons are having a tough time pulling in the electrons right which is why the electron cloud actually expands or it gets bigger because now they're being outnumbered the protons are outnumbered by the number of electrons around them so now they're having a tough time pulling them in so you just have to understand cations shrink anions expand and it just has to do with the difference between the number of protons that you have in the nucleus and the number of electrons in the electron cloud. The ionic radius trend is easy to understand because it's similar to a trend that we discussed already, the atomic radius. So just like the atomic radius, if you go left to right within the same row, the ions tend to shrink or decrease. There is just one little reset that occurs, which I'll explain in just a moment, but if you look carefully between columns 4a and 5a, carbon is small, but then it resets. Nitrogen is big, but going left to right, it gets small, and I'll explain why in just a moment. But I just want to point out that going top to bottom, just like the atomic radius trend, the ionic radii are also increasing top to bottom within the same column. So I've already explained that cations shrink and anions expand. So going left to right, if you look at lithium's row, lithium, let's say, is a plus one, and he's about that big, followed by a plus two, plus three, and then once he gets a carbon, carbon is really small because he forms a plus four cation. He has lost four electrons. Now, there is a reset that occurs between the fourth and the fifth column because within the fifth column, now you start to encounter non-metals like nitrogen and nitrogen gains three electrons. So it picks up three electrons and now it's huge because you gain three electrons, you're massive, okay? A negative two means you're about that big and then a negative one fluorine is still relatively big compared to the other cations on the other side of the periodic table. So you have to understand this reset occurs because you're now entering a region of the periodic table where the elements want to gain electrons. So again, remember there's a staircase that's on the periodic table Anything to the left of the staircase means you're a metal, and metals tend to lose or give up electrons. And when you give up electrons, you shrink. If you're to the right of the staircase, you are a non-metal, and now non-metals tend to gain electrons, and when you gain electrons, you get bigger. The third trend that I want to discuss is something called electronegativity, which is the desire or the hunger for electrons. So if you think back to the trends that we've been discussing, and you look at the periodic table, anything to the left of the periodic table is a metal, and metals tend to lose electrons in order to become stable, which means metals are not electronegative at all. They have no desire for electrons because they're looking to get rid of them in the first place. So look at the periodic table carefully. I want you to notice the numbers, okay, you don't have to memorize the numbers, but the numbers are actually very small on the left, okay? The numbers, like for example, sodium is 0.9 and magnesium is like 1.3, okay? Those are like their electronegativity ratings or rankings. So those numbers are not very big at all because those metals are not electronegative. Now, as you move left to right, Notice how the colors also kind of change. So you have like this blue shade or like this bluish hue of color, which indicates that they're not electronegative. But by the time you get to the right side of the periodic table, those numbers are now bigger. And there's also like an orange or like reddish hue on the table. And that indicates that those elements are electronegative. They really want electrons. They're electron hungry, electron desperate. So notice how fluorine is the most electronegative element that's there on the periodic table. It really wants one more electron so that it can satisfy the octet rule. So going left to right, the electronegativity increases, but there's just one thing you have to understand, and that is noble gases are actually zero electronegativity. Okay, so they tend not to want electrons at all. So noble gases are even less electronegative than metals. 
So you kind of have to think of the noble gases as a column that you have to cut and then paste to the left of the alkali metals. So going from left to right, noble gases are the least electronegative, followed by your metals, and then finally your nonmetals are the most electronegative or electron desperate families. So I can't overemphasize the importance of the electronegativity trend. I think it's a trend that allows you to understand the other ones. So just to summarize, the least electronegative would be the noble gas family. So I box them in blue because the noble gases, remember, are already stable. So that means they have no need or no desire to gain electrons. Electronegativity just means what is your desire or your desperation levels for electrons. Next, you have metals, which are found to the left of the staircase. And these guys I boxed in yellow because they're not so electronegative at all. They tend to lose electrons. And finally, you have your non-metals, which are found to the right of the staircase. So it's squished in between your metals and your noble gases. And non-metals tend to want electrons. These guys are really electronegative. They have high electronegativity because they're desperate for one or two or three more electrons to help them satisfy the octet rule. Because remember, if you have eight electrons in your outer valence shells, then that means you're stable like a noble gas. It's better to understand the electronegativity trend as opposed to memorizing, but if you wanted a quick visual going left to right, the electronegativity increases, but then it comes to a standstill or it drops to zero as soon as you reach the noble gas family. The last trend we want to discuss is something called ionization energy, and it's basically how much energy is required to take away an atom's electron to turn it into an ion. Okay, so basically how easy or how difficult is it to take away an electron from an element? So I want you to notice a few trends. So let's look on the graph where it does like the weird spikes and the zigzags. What family do you notice is at the bottom of the chart? So you have lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium. So that family would be the alkali metal family. So those guys tend to be at the bottom of the chart because it's quite easy to steal from them. It doesn't take that much energy to take away their electrons. Metals, remember, are really easy to take electrons from because they're looking to get rid of those electrons anyways. So the alkali family is extremely easy to steal from. It's very easy to take their electrons away because again, it's kind of related to electronegativity where they don't desire electrons. They're looking to get rid of them anyways. Now, I want you to take a look at the graph and notice which families tend to have the highest ionization energy, meaning which ones are the most difficult to steal from. And if you look at the graph, you would see that your noble gases tend to spike. So you have helium, neon, argon, krypton, xenon, and radon. So noble gases, remember, already have a full set of valence electrons, so it becomes increasingly difficult to come in there and take their electrons away. These guys are extremely protective of their electrons. Okay, so helium, even though it's the smallest atom, remember, it's the smallest, which means its nucleus is like right here, and the electron cloud is like basically here. It only has two electrons, so it has a really easy time reeling in those electrons. It's holding onto it in a very stingy and protective way. Whereas if you get bigger, okay, if your atom's electron cloud is now bigger, your nucleus that's here in the center has a much tougher time controlling those outer electrons. So your charge is not as effective at pulling in or reeling in those electrons, which means if you look carefully, the ionization energy decreases as the element gets bigger. So remember, if you go back to atomic radius, if you go top to bottom, your atom size actually increases. But what also happens is the ionization energy decreases because it becomes easier to just come in there and just take their electrons away because the nucleus is only here, the electrons are way out here. So that charge is very weak, so it can't hold on to those electrons, okay? So that's another thing that you can understand, and that is the size also has an effect on how easy or how difficult it is to take an electron away from an element.
So in a way, ionization energy follows the same pattern as electronegativity, except there's just one little thing that changes for noble gases, and that is noble gases are the highest ionization energy, but they have zero electronegativity. It makes sense, right? Because noble gases already have a full set, they want to hold their electrons, and there's no need for them to gain electrons, which is electronegativity. So if you read how the graph spikes and you understand going from left to right, the electronegativity and the ionization energy increases, let's put this all together as we look at the graph. So starting with hydrogen, it then spikes to helium, which is a noble gas. And then guess what happens as you go from helium to lithium? It just drops, it plummets, because now you've gone from a noble gas, which is on the far right of the periodic table, to now the far left, it resets again, and it becomes an alkali metal on the far left. So that's why the ionization energy just drops, because now you're a metal, and metals tend to lose electrons. And when you lose electrons, it becomes easy to steal from you, because that was your purpose anyways. That was your intention. You wanted to lose electrons. So now lithium, from lithium you have beryllium, which then goes up. It kind of drops again, just slightly, for boron. Then you have carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, and now you reach neon, which is the summit, and it's pretty high, ionization energy. And then guess what happens between neon and sodium? Then it drops again, it plummets, and now you start to slowly climb back up. Okay, It's a trend, or it's a pattern, it's a, it's a periodic trend. It starts to climb again, and now you reach argon, which is farthest to the right, and it's a noble gas. And then guess what happens between argon and potassium? AR and then K, it just drops. Okay, alkali metal again, then it slowly finds its way back up to krypton. Okay, then you have krypton and then it falls back down to rubidium. So it's a little zigzag pattern. It goes up, it spikes up, then it drops, then it builds itself back up, then it drops again. So that's the general pattern or the trend for ionization energy, which is how easy or how difficult is it to steal an electron away from an element? So there you have it. That was my whole talk on the four periodic trends. You have atomic radius, ionic radius, electronegativity, and ionization energy. And if you understand the four trends, it gives you a better understanding of the periodic table and why certain elements are found to the left of the staircase. So for example, metals are found to the left of the periodic table because they tend to lose electrons and nonmetals are found to the right of the staircase, that little zigzag that separates metals from metalloids and nonmetals. Nonmetals are found to the right of the periodic table because they tend to gain electrons. So in short, atomic radius and ionic radius have to do with the sizes of your atoms or your ions. Electronegativity has to do with your desire for electrons. How badly do you want electrons? So that means non-metals really want electrons badly. And then finally, you have ionization energy, which means how difficult is it to steal an electron from you? So that means noble gases and non-metals are pretty hard to steal from because they really want their electrons. They really want to keep them. And metals are extremely easy to steal from. So that does it. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time on Wind Chemistry.